All right. Got it. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, as Stella said, I'm Michaela Parker. I'm the founder and executive director of the Academic Data Science Alliance, and I will be the moderator for today. I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. First up, we have Dr. Magdalena Balazinska. She is a former, she is a professor of the Bill and, and a Bill and Melinda Gates Chair and Director of the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. Her research interests are in the field of database management systems and current research focuses on data management for data science, big data systems, cloud computing, and image and video analytics. Previously, she was the Director of the eScience Institute and my boss. <laughs> the Associate Vice Provost for Data Science and the Director of the Advanced Data Science PhD option. Magdalena is an ACM Fellow and holds a PhD from MIT. She has received a number of awards, including the inaugural VLB Women in Database Research Award, an ACM SIGMOD Test of Time Award, and an NSF Career Award, and two Google Research Awards. So welcome, Magda. Next up, we have Jeffrey Bloom, who is a data scientist, administrator, and biostatistician with vast experience building and leading academic programs. He is the Quantitative Foundation Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs and Data Science at UVA's School of Data Science, that's University of Virginia. Previously, he served as Director of Graduate Education at Vanderbilt's Data Science Institute and Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Biostatistics and was a tenured professor in biostatistics with secondary appointments in biomedical informatics and biochemistry at Vanderbilt. He proposed and established the Master's in Data Science at Vanderbilt University and established the Master of Public Health program at Brown University. His areas of research and collaboration include radiology, cancer diagnosis and prediction, nephrology, translational biomedicine, fMRI, and women's health. Bloom holds a PhD in biostatistics from Johns Hopkins and a BA in statistics from the State University of New York at Buffalo. So welcome, Jeffrey. And finally, we have Dr. Rebecca Nugent. She is the Stephen E. and Joyce Feinberg Professor of Statistics and Data Science and head of the Carnegie Mellon Department of Statistics and Data Science. She is the founding director of the Statistics and Data Science Corporate Capstone Program and serves on the leadership team for the NSF AI Institute for Societal Decision Making. Dr. Nugent received her PhD in statistics from the University of Washington, go UW, her MS in statistics from Stanford University, and her BA in mathematics, statistics, and Spanish from Rice University. She has worked extensively in clustering and classification methodology with an emphasis on high dimensional big data problems and record linkage applications. Her current research focuses on the development and deployment of low barrier data analysis platforms for adaptive instruction and the study of data science as a science. She has won several awards, including the American Statistical Association Waller Award for Innovation in Statistics and Education. So welcome, Rebecca, and welcome all of you. Um, it's so wonderful to have you here together and to talk about this very timely topic, um, tenure and the tenure process for data science professors. So I just gave very quick formal bios for the three of you, but I wonder if just to get things going, you could tell us a little bit about um, your school, department, institute, uh, your role within that school, how long you've been in that role and what what aspects of that role involve you in tenure and promotion committees. And um, I guess we'll go ahead in alphabetical order to start. So Magda, if you wanna kick us off. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, uh, Michaela and Asla for organizing. Um, so again, my name is Magda Balazinska. I'm currently the director of the Allen School. That's our uh, School of Computer Science and Engineering here at the University of Washington. Uh, in terms of size, we have about 370 PhD students right now, and uh, we have about 2,500 students total. Uh, so that's a little bit kind of the, the size. Um, uh, for a faculty, I would say a little bit over 90 FTE. Um, out of that, maybe 75 on the tenure track. So just to kind of see the, the kind of school we are in as, you know, as is relevant for uh, for this conversation. Uh, and yeah, we have, you know, I think we have a very broad set of faculty members reaching across different domains, uh, definitely hiring primarily uh, people with background in computer science, but also having some faculty who have background in uh, kind of more on the data science side. 
Great. And maybe um, just briefly, are you involved in uh, the tenure process for all of the mm -hmm. data science related faculty or is that someone else or? Yeah. No, that's a good point. So we have one tenure process uh, within the Allen School. So as the director, of course, I'm kind of have I'm heavily involved in that process in kind of all the different stages. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeffrey. You want to take a stab? You're on mute. <laughs> so yes, is that better? Yeah. So I, first, maybe I feel obligated to find my um, connection to UW. Apparently, it's a UW oriented panel. I did overlap for one year with Patrick Hagerty, who's the chair of Biostat at UW. That's the closest I can. That's the closest I can. I can get. Um, but there are a lot of Hopkins people at UW, and and uh, UW people at Hopkins actually a, a good mix. Um, so uh, who am I? So I'm Jeffrey Bloom. I'm a biostatistician. I do a lot of prediction modeling, um, and uh, I have, uh, am classically trained in in inference, statistical inference. So uh, that's what I did before the big uh, big data, big da data science revolution sort of came along. Um, and I'm now the associate uh, dean for academics and faculty affairs at the University of Virginia, which is a new school. We're uh, in our third year, so the two years under our belt. We are building all of our promotion and tenure procedures and hiring large amounts of faculty at a time. I think we hired 13 people last year, 15 the year before. There'll be a growth to about um, to about. Um, 50 or two full-time equivalent faculty, two thirds of that will be on the tenure track. One third will be on a, what we call a general faculty track, which is a mix of research and teaching. Um, and so we, we have a nice mixed faculty and we view data science very broadly. So it's not just a machine learning shop. So we have people who specialize um, in history and policy and law and government as well as people who do systems work, high performance computing, human computer interaction. We have a, a big mix. We have statisticians. Um, we have uh, people doing computer vision, a lot of deep learning. So we have a little bit of mix of everything. So we have a big melting pot. And so to try and put together a quote unquote uniform and fair promotion and tenure process has been quite the challenge. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking uh, a little bit um, about what we are what we are doing, what we're trying to do. And can you just clarify a little bit, what's your role in terms of the, when a faculty is up for, or are you too soon yet? Have you not had any up for tenure and promotion? No, we have. We're, we're actually rewriting. There were existing guidelines when the school was first established. So we operated under those and we, we basically hired in some mid-level uh, people, people who are fifth or sixth year uh, assistant professors who got promoted. And we hired in some senior people who would come in with promotion. So we had to run our promotion tent, tent process through that last year um but we none of the people that we originally hired straight out of school or out of a postdoc for example are close so okay. that's the majority of people uh, that we're building and my job is to put that whole process together uh, i don't sit on the school-wide pnt because i'm the person who nominates people and puts their package together and it goes to the school-wide pnt committee and comes back and the other thing i should say is we don't have departments so we just have one big, we act as one big department. So there's a department level process, then there's a school-wide process. And then I manage all that and I send the entire packet then to the Dean who says yes or no, and then to the provost. So that's, that's Got fine. It. Okay, so uh, let's, let's dig in a little bit to the tenure process. Um, Jeff, Jeffrey, we were just talking, you were just talking about how you had uh, PNT guidelines in place when you established the school, but it sounds like you're rethinking those now. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that process looks like and and what why you're thinking of changing some of it? Uh, well, the process um, mimicked very much an engineering school process. So the people who put the institute together were, were um, in large part um, had all their experiences, uh, previous experience was in engineering. And um, so that they just basically mimicked that engineering type process. Um, and we have, we just hired um, a, a senior associate professor, for example, from Illinois Tech, Mar Hicks, who uh, is basically a professor of, of history, of how data and data evolves in history. And so 
um, we needed uh, we just needed a set of of guidelines that was more broad in scope about what does it mean to make contributions to the field of data science, how do you measure those contributions, and things like this. We're also working in all sorts of you know, things that we sort of incentivize the behavior that we want people to work on. So open science, looking for things uh, the, where people are participating in open science and reproducible research. Um, software, giving credit for software development and sort of saying that these are all things um, that we will, that we encourage and we'll look for along the way. Um, there's no general formula, right? So it's all about what are the things that are within and the, within bounds and that you want to see, but things that you mentioned in the policy, people are highly attuned to, and then they, um, they sort of gear their behavior around that. So, so we're, we're trying to emphasize the things that the school would like to emphasize and have a lot of discussions about things like uh, reproducible and open science, for example, takes a lot of time. So people who engage in that might end up being not as productive by traditional measures, you know, as, as you would otherwise be. Um, and so there has to be some realization that that's okay so that people will go and engage in that activity. Um, things like giving credit for people who put together data sets that other people use. Um, and trying to sort of ferret out the difference between just posting what you have and it's a mess and no one can reproduce it and people who go to great lengths to put together things that are that are highly reproducible, but then it may get a lot of attention and a lot of criticism, but th this we should be viewed as a positive, right? So we're trying to balance and we're sort of rewriting our, our policies um, to uh, emphasize what we th think we would like to see um, moving forward. Um, and also we are so diverse that there's a lot of concern about whether or not the committee will understand people's work. And so trying to get people to a place where they understand that it's not, they're not going to, all their work's not going to be evaluated by people who are just in their space, that they need to be able to have slightly broader impact, but also that the committee is good about understanding what scholarship is. Um, and you, in the statements that you write, for example, for your PNT process are very important, um, and, um, help people understand what you have or haven't, um, contributed and what your views are. And so all these things are important. So we're trying to work, work those parts in as, as we go through. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I do want to loop back in a minute to the idea of all the disciplines that data science touches, but I wanted to ask Magda because it does raise something that we worked on very for a long time as part of the Morrison data science environments was this idea of alternative metrics right how do you how do you evaluate the work of a data scientist and how can those alternative metrics be woven into the tenure process and so Magda I don't know if there's been much movement at UW in terms of like changing some of those PNT metrics maybe you could talk a little bit about that yeah, absolutely. So I think what's important to um, to understand in a promotion and tenure case is that everyone will get evaluated in terms of high level categories, right? And these high level categories are typically uh, research and fundraising will be one category with both aspects, the research and the fundraising. The next category is going to be teaching and advising. Right. So kind of the, the teaching that we are doing, the advising the students. And then you can also have uh, the, the kind of the last categories, of course, going to be service uh, and uh, uh, diversity, equity inclusion can be either kind of in kind of a separate category or maybe woven through the other categories. So now what's interesting is if we think about promoting someone as what are their accomplishments in these high level buckets, then you can see that there's actually a lot of ways to have impact. So kind of a good way to think about this is we have these for high level buckets, research fundraising, teaching, advising, service, and optionally diversity, equity, inclusion when, when that applies. Um, and we want to show impact in those categories. Now for different people, impact will look differently. And I think what's absolutely critical is to realize that what is obvious to me might not be obvious to somebody else. So it's just important to spell out the impact. So I can say maybe under the research category, I published journal papers, and everyone obviously knows that journal papers are important. Well, maybe not. In computer science, they're not important. So it's good to say, you know, in my discipline, the primary publication venues are the following. And look, I have all of these publications in those venues, which are the primary venues for my domain. 
or you can say I did this open source software and for my domain, the kind of work that I do, this is really important. Look at all the, I don't know, GitHub stars or all the downloads or how many times my software was used or cited in another uh, person's paper. Uh, even something obvious, like uh, I had a tenure case at some point and you know, the, the, the committee was like, well, this person did not yet graduate any um, uh, students. Uh, so I started to actually explicitly write and say in computer science, it takes five to six years to get a PhD which is about the same duration as a tenure clock. It is not an expectation that someone has graduated their first student by the time they go up for tenure. So kind of the two of the main pieces of advice in general is thinking about promotion and tenure in these broad categories. And then just realizing that we have to spell out uh, why something is important and how it is making impact because then the committee, then people from who are different and kind of use different criteria understand the importance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it also goes to that next question I wanted to ask, which is the issue of diverse disciplines and domains that are all touched by data science. And if you have, in Jeffrey's case, for example, a faculty person in history with data science, right, how do you, do you bring in folks from, do you have somebody on that tenure committee, Jeff, that is is from that field that can speak to that work? Or how do you, because the person can say, yes, this is the importance journal in my field do you take their word for it or is there is there somebody well, so on the in, in history there are no journals there's no conference proceedings that you write two books and you get your you gotta write a book yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i i think and and so um in this case the pnt um committee actually had to to do two things one is they really tried to understand well what's it mean to write a book can you just write a book and self-publish on amazon and you get tenure actually no there are preferred publishers that you get comments on your book, you get reviews on your book, and that all these things go into play um, when you when when you go up for tenure. So so there is some of that sort of traditional academic um, scholarship behavior around. I've published something and now I get feedback, and you can kind of address it. So so that was the first thing to really understand and to go and and find those. The other is, and this is one of the things we're writing into our PNT committee is we asked for outside opinions. And so we formalize this um, now that at the departmental level, if uh, which for us is the school, right? It's everybody. If we feel like we want to ask for an outside opinion, then the faculty promotion tenure committee, which is not the school wide, can do that and can go out and get a, and ask for a couple outside opinions. And we asked for one outside and one internal opinion to supplement the letters. Um, both were, were very positive. Um, and it was a little bit about like, well, what would the expectations be in history? But then also there was, you know, there was a conversation of whether or not the expectations history means you automatically get tenure in data science. So then and so the committee, the committee basically argued no, that you know, you needed to be prominent scholar and history is fine, but there had to be a connection to data science. So the so the way the way we sort of came away thinking of, about this is it doesn't matter what area you come through we want you to be a scholar in your area and you can tell us what that comprises of but you we want you to do two things one is we want you to push the field of data science forward proper make some sort of contribution if you have for statisticians they would think of this as a methodological contribution it would be more than just a data analysis but so you would you would push the field forward and then in addition to that, we have sort of two things. We ask for people also to explain how they're pushing, using the, our, their data science tools and knowledge to either push science or society forward. So there's an application piece. And so we want people who do, who do both. So it's not just sufficient to contribute to the mathematically to a particular topic. You have to then also help move something else forward. Um, and you can do that in the context of whatever your discipline was. In this particular case, this was a, um, a history professor who had studied how data was used um, basically um, to um, um, discriminate against um, in early World War II certain demographic types. And, and so how the collection of data um, and its maintenance and what it was used for, you know, how that impacts society and how you target specific groups. So, and so, and then there were safeguards for that and, and how we think about that um, uh, framework. So that's sort of how we, how we thought about it. But those are the two main things that we sort of look through. And we, it doesn't matter whether you're a computer scientist, statistician, history professor, 
You have to push the field of data science forward first, and then you have to use your tools to do good somewhere. That's great. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I see Rebecca joined, but I wanted to ask, um, because we're sort of on this topic now, um, Magda, if um, if some of what Jeff has, also, has talked about is also woven in, I was thinking particularly of the um, the joint hires that eScience did a few years ago, like Bing Brunton, for example, mm -hmm. where there were instances of a hire and then I think uh, faculty from the domain department were included in, in some of those P&T committees, if I'm right, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Like are, are the yeah. domains brought into the tenure review? That's a good question. There's also a question in the chat, I think that just uh, relates to what Jeff just said. So maybe Jeff, you can clarify uh, before we move on. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you see that, Jeff, or do you want me to? Uh, I'm checking. I'm checking the chat. I'm going to read it because uh, for the folks if that are going to watch this later on the recording, okay. they can't see the chat. So um, David Monjo asked, I am confused by the UVA model. The historian case is the person trying to get tenure in a department and a school because both are funding the position. So it was that that historian example, is that a joint funded position between a history department and the no. school of data nope. science? That person is a professor of data science. They have a courtesy appointment in the history department, but that doesn't come with any funding. It's not a joint appointment. It's 100 percent in data science. 100 percent in the school of data science. OK, great. Yeah, so our model, is, so the, this is uh, great, and our model is different. So uh, at the UW, we have a large uh, data science institute. It's called uh, eScience, uh, and um, uh, it actually we just celebrated our fifteenth anniversary. So part of the reason we're called eScience is because we were founded before eScience was uh, sorry, data science was a term. Uh, but that institute does not have uh, faculty lines or tenure lines. So when we hire faculty members, we hire them in different traditional departments uh, and potentially with partial funding from other places or joint across different units. Uh, so then when we actually do the tenure process, we will work with those units. If someone is in one unit, well, that's going to be the unit that will evaluate them. If they are different from other traditional people in their unit, this is where you know people have to work, like I mentioned, to just explain for this person what would be the right criteria, how does uh, their work translate into impact. And if someone is joined across the two units, then of course the two units have to be involved in that uh, promotion process and there are different you know, poss possible models here. Great, thank you. All right, Rebecca, can you hear us and can you join? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yay. All okay, right. So perfect. I'd can you, yeah, I'd like to apologize to everyone to start off. My current location is very low bandwidth. This is not a typical location. So I apologize to everyone. And thank you to my fellow panelists for, for answering all the questions at the beginning. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to just give us, Rebecca, a brief uh, overview of um, the school or department, your, I think, department, what your role is there? And also dive in specifically into your role with tenure promotion and how that works at your school yeah for yeah for sure thanks Michaela. um so i'm the head of the department of statistics and data science at carnegie mellon university so uh, with respect to my role i'll just briefly say there are seven different colleges at carnegie mellon uh, we have a school of computer science so our computer science department is inside that school as well as our machine learning department and then we also have a math department inside our mellon college of science and then statistics and data science is a separate department within the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So the, the reason I'm mentioning that is because a lot of the disciplines that you um, would typically associate with data science are in separate colleges at Carnegie Mellon. There's an awful lot of shared appointments, joint appointments, primary in one, minor in another, affiliations, things like that. But for us, when you are faculty in the Department of Statistics and Data Science, you go through the promotion and tenure process in Dietrich College. So as head, I'm part of shepherding that package, um, you know, putting together materials, help managing the PNT process. And then I also serve on the college level committee for um, PNT, and then it will leave the college and it will move on to the university uh, committee, you know, like most places. So in terms of Thinking about specifically the data science folks, um, we have a few different faculty tracks at Carnegie Mellon. So if you're on the tenure track, which is what we're kind of primarily talking about today, um, your external letters might come from a variety of different places, um, external to the university though. 
Uh, in the data science world for us at CMU, we actively look for letters, et cetera, from the disciplines and the domains that people are collaborating with. So it's not uncommon to have letters coming in from neuroscience, from um, you know, astronomy, public policy, you name it, uh, to, to try to support that process. So part of, part of my role is also to communicate with those other disciplines and get support letters from them. Uh, I just briefly want to mention we also have a teaching track and a research track. Those are faculty lines. They're fully funded faculty lines. Um, it's not the same as being an instructor, for example. And um, in those cases, we, we sim I similarly shepherd um, those people. We have uh, people on the teaching track who specialize in data science education. And so they also go through a promotion and a tenure um, track. The tenure is um, a little bit like tenure in quotes. It's, it's a little bit more like you have kind of a you know, you're staying on the line for a while, but you, you still have reviews and, and promotions and things. Um, and in that case, we are allowed to get letters and support from both external to the university and within the university. So again, very common to get support letters uh, from other disciplines, not just from what we would consider traditionally statistics and data science. So I will stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna pause here for a second and see if there's any questions from the audience before I move on. Nope, oh, Torbett. Yeah, so, and I'm thinking about, you know, if, if you're in a, a department of computer and engineering versus a, a, a interdisciplinary data, data science school versus a statistics and data science, like what classes would you teach? Say you're a, a domain education policy person in my case, are you going to be teaching classes that would be cross-listed in other departments? Um, is would would the position in a computer and uh, engineering school would that would would you take a public policy person? Would that person go through the eScience Institute if there was a joint hire and and be and go to a different department? So how um, interdisciplinary do you get within these three different models for data science administration? Sounds like Magda, you want to start with that one and then... Yeah, I'm happy to start with that one. So that's a really great question. Uh, so we are, uh, the Allen School is a school of computer science and engineering, so more in that traditional sense. When we look at people who are uh, very much interdisciplinary. Like for example, we currently have a search with atmospheric sciences. So the goal here is to have someone who has one foot in atmospheric sciences, one foot in computer science. We're actually setting it up as a joint appointment. So the person is going to be like, you know, a part of their appointment will be in one of those units and part of the appointment will be in other unit. When we hire someone like that, um, we are on a quarter system. So our faculty members have to teach one class per quarter for three quarters. And then there's summer that, um, that the tenure track faculty don't teach over the summer. So we often are going to split appointments two thirds, one thirds, uh, which means the person is responsible for teaching two classes in one unit and the other class in the other unit, which gives them flexibility in terms of the kinds of classes that they teach. Uh, we also can cross list classes when uh, they are you know, on topics that can be relevant. So that's another option if you want to have some uh, classes that are going to be at the boundary between computer science and other, uh, and other units. Uh, so I would say both models for teaching work that you teach in, kind of you alternate where you teach, uh, or you can also create classes that are kind of joint and cross listed. Jeff or Rebecca, do you want to jump in on that? Sure. Um, so our model at UVA, I, th I think, is a little different. So the school's new. So the, our School of Data Science doesn't have departments. We do, um, and we have a commitment to building all of our own classes. So while there are some feeder classes that exist either in STAT or CS, we are rebuilding everything. And they're all data science mnemonics. Um, and um, we're trying not to repeat what is available elsewhere in the university. So the idea is if you need to take uh, a particular uh, class in some department and we would teach the exact same thing, then we're not going to stand that class up. But then uh, but uh, what goes along with that is, well, if you're learning about data science, there are some things that you learn differently and, and some things that you don't need. So we're going through what are traditional CS and stat education, for example, and trying to take out what we think the data scientists don't know uh, and emphasize what they do so that people who go through and get a bachelor's in data science or a master's in data science or a PhD in data science have that blended, blended model and blended feel. 
Um, it's it's tricky. So our faculty teach data science courses, and those courses are everything from ethics and policy courses in high performance computing, cloud computing, human computer interaction and statistics and deep learning and computer vision. I mean, we have them all. Um, but the idea is that they're not replicates of what you would find elsewhere. So they're condensed or tu or tuned to the to what you would need in the data science field. Um, we're still figuring out exactly what that means um, and um, sort of adjusting. But we have, you know, if you take a student into, say, a PhD program in data science and you say, well, OK, I need you to learn everything that you would learn as uh, getting a master's in stat. And I need you to learn everything that you would need to get a be a master's in CS. And then you're capable of doing your PhD. Then you don't have a PhD program. You just have 10 years. Uh, of time, <laughs> right? Uh, five years of coursework. So then the question is, what do you cut out? And the only way we could figure to cut out was rather than cutting out classes was to to build a tailored curriculum so that we could pull the things together that we think we need and take the things out that we don't. And then students can go and get enhancements in CS and engineering or in STAT if they want to take some more traditional things. Um, and so we do have faculty, all our faculty teach data science courses, but we do have joint faculty who also teach in, in systems or in statistics, for example. How about you, Rebecca? Yeah, so so over at Carnegie Mellon, um, we, we similarly do not, we don't want to create courses that are already exist in other places. So for example, the, our machine learning department, you know, which is top notch is already teaching, you know, several graduate level courses that um, in, in deep learning, et cetera, machine learning um, databases, et cetera, that, that we can use. For, for our curriculum over in statistics and data science. And so we, we our department really spans the range of coursework from um, you know, very theoretical classes, uh, more traditional classical theoretical classes, um, newer theoretical things, conformal inference and the like, um, through applied things, through methodology, through statistical computing. So, so our faculty, we have a wide range of faculty that have expertise in each of those areas. So the faculty that you might label more the data science side of the house, they, they tend to work um, on the, more on the computing and the applied methods classes. Um, they tend to have an interdisciplinary focus. They tend to incorporate projects with collaborators from either other research disciplines or from industry. We bring an awful lot of real world problems into our classes. So our, our more data science-y, for lack of a better word, faculty tend to work in those spaces. Um, they, but they will teach in our undergrad program, our master's program, our PhD program. They're not assigned into a specific level. Um, and uh, our, for us, uh, the tenure track faculty teach, uh, we're, a, we're a semester school and we teach one and one in our department. And uh, if you're on the teaching track, you can teach two and two, but it tends to be that our teaching track focuses uh, ends up doing two and one, where the remainder of their uh, time is spent doing things like developing curriculum, running programs, working on, uh, on those capstone relationships with uh, corporate uh, partners, et cetera. So all the other kinds of things that go along with running data science programs, um, those, and I'll, I'll just throw this out there. I don't know if you covered it while I was out, but those should be counting toward um, service and toward education and, and, and toward your professional development. We should not ignore all of the other kinds of non-traditional classwork that is necessary when supporting a data science program and administrators should be taking that into account when they're thinking about the PNT process. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, that's really wonderful to hear. And I don't think we didn't actually cover that. So this is a really <laughs> good point. Um, so I know Magda has to jump off in three minutes. So I want to, I'm going to skip over some of the things that we were going to talk about just to give you a chance, Magda, before you have to leave. Um, so many of the folks that watch these recordings are um, in that kind of earlier career. So they might be looking to apply for a faculty position and wondering what that's going to look like. What is the tenure process going to look like for them? Do you have any tips you could give to um, either current assistant professors looking at tenure coming down the road or, or even students who are thinking, I, I think I wanna go down the faculty road, but what will I be facing in terms of um, 
managing, you know, their, their, their tenure file, how to manage service commitments, um, how to make the review committee's life easier, anything like any tips you could suggest for uh, that tenure review process from the position of the person who's submitting their tenure package. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, so let's uh, th let's just focus first on people who are already in a tenure track position. So someone just started; they're you know junior assistant professor, uh, and they will be this kind of data science person or some kind of maybe non traditional uh, person. What I highly recommend is, uh, I mean, first of all, remember that your colleagues actually they all voted for you to be there. They are excited that you are here and they want to be supportive. So I think what's important is a couple of things. One is take time to explain to others about your work and take time to like, you know, have coffee with people, tell them about your work and tell them why it's important and why it's impactful and how it's impactful. And doing that kind of early and often is good because it gets people used to the fact uh, to say, oh, you know, we have this person on our faculty and they are doing this exciting, unusual work. And this is how that work is having an impact. So spending time to make sure you get to know your colleagues, you talk to them, and you explain to them how uh, things work in your field and how you're having an impact and why this is important. I think this is really good because then by the time you kind of put your packet together or even for each annual review, no one is surprised. They kind of know, know what to expect, they know. Uh, one challenge uh, often when we put together um, kind of tenure cases is of course to find the, light, uh, the correct letter writers. This is really critical and if someone is kind of unusual in a field where we don't have other faculty members, this can be especially tricky. Uh, so of course, as a candidate, you don't get any say into who the letter writers are, but that's why it's good if your colleagues know about like the main publication venues in your field, some of the main universities that do work in your field, because that will help them without consulting you, that will help them also figure out, you know, who the correct letter writers are. Uh, so I would say kind of those would be my, maybe my main uh, advice for people who are, um, already on the tenure track. For anyone early on considering, I would say there's a lot of excitement and people, uh, no matter what department they're in, people care about societal impact. They care about, uh, you know, exciting technology. They care about those things. So never be discouraged. Uh, try to apply to different places. Write your uh, statements knowing that they're going to be read by maybe all kinds of people. So again, in those statements, just advertising and emphasizing why what you're doing is important and exciting. Uh, and you might be surprised that people might, you know, you might see something as a maybe traditional statistics, traditional computer science or something, or maybe it's like this uh, you know, new interdisciplinary. They might really like what you're doing. Uh, so don't pre-filter yourself. Apply, apply, apply everywhere you think might be exciting. And then just know that your letter will be re read by all kinds of different people. So make sure it, it resonates with different kinds of people. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Magda. And I know you, you have to go. So thank know, you I'm for sorry joining about us. Yeah. Yeah. That's a <laughs> no, totally fine. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Okay, so, well, can, uh, can I jump in Rebecca, there? Rebecca, I was just uh, going to say, yes, please do. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to jump in there on that notion that uh, Magda just said about not pre-filtering yourself. I, I think that is an incredibly important advice. I think our data science junior professors or people who are moving into data science and you know it, she was distinguishing me between these two groups i think that they are the future leaders i mean they are people who are going to be changing the field changing the field in ways that we, the ways that we need you know creating solutions for for problems that we're all facing i mean they are it is incredibly exciting but that this is also a little bit nerve-wracking to be the ones responsible for changing the field when you feel like the senior people in a field, you know, are judging you based on, on things that were, um, you know, a more traditional view of the academic system. There are lots of senior people in academia who are aware that this evolution is happening. They want to help it happen. And anything that a junior data science person can do to summarize the kind of impacts that they're having with their work, you know, via, you know, maybe it's explaining how many downloads a certain package had or these different kinds of press pieces that might come out or different ways that your work is being disseminated other than the traditional journal system. Anything that you can do to help tell that story will help people understand the impact that you're having. But I really want to underscore not don't filter yourself be, be be the amazing data science researcher and academic that you're going to be because we need you to be that 
we need you to show the amazing research and work that you're doing. It's a lot of pressure to be the people who are changing the field, but, but that's, that's where we are right now. So, so continue to be yourself and continue to do the good work that you're thinking about. And, you know, everyone else is going to catch up with you eventually. So, so I guess that's what I wanted to add. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and there is a question in the chat, but Jeff, before we move to that, did you want to just pile on here? Yeah, no, I, I did want to pile on a little bit in the sense that um, very often I think there's an assumption for junior faculty to think that senior faculty are expecting more of the same. In many cases, at least as I've put the school together, I have all these people who wanted to come and try something new. Even the senior faculty, in some sense, are rooting for the junior faculty to do things that the senior faculty 100%. W- weren't able to do or were discouraged yeah. doing, like developing use- usable software. And so they value this as a contribution and they're waiting for their opportunity to um, you know, uh, support people who are doing these activities. And so talk with people. Te- I think all oh, this is a great example. Tell them what's going on, but also don't assume that people are just waiting for more of the same. In many cases, they're rooting for some changes and you're the agent of change in the beginning. And then as they put you through the PT process, you're part of that agent of change too. And so don't be scared of it. It's good. It's healthy. Yeah, I love that. We actually have a nitty gritty question in the chat that has to do with exactly how to project those kind of alternate metrics in your package. Um, Melissa asks, for promotion packages, do you ask that research outputs like protocols, data sets, what we just talked about, are on the CV under a certain header? And if so, do you ask that anything specific is called out like reuse or what was needed to make the data reusable? So what, yeah, so one thing that I would say is I've been to a number of places and every place has a different system for how they organize their CV. So it's less about how you organize your CV and more about how you write your statement about yourself. If it if, if it's CV, you should put anything that you think might have been important or could potentially seem important and took more than 30 seconds, you should put it on your CV. I mean, this is how CVs, you know, get large and um, also... It, things like when you go give talks, what you talked on, all of that, wherever it is, mentoring opportunities, they all need to go on your CV. Things that like this that are more important, I think you, you don't want to have them get buried and just rely on someone reading your CV. You need to to dedicate some of your um, some of your real estate when you're explaining who you are and what your contributions are to things like this is what I did and this is why it's important. Let me just point out that I did this blah 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 blah, and you can find it here. That's that. That's how I would hit, sort of handle that. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to now ask another question that had come up from the audience. Um, is there data on the likelihood of getting tenure for faculty who have joint appointments? This is getting back to a, a department that can hire fully, like SDS at UVA, versus uh, joint appointments. Um, in other words, is there a higher likelihood that you won't get tenure? I guess maybe people, maybe there's a perception that it's more difficult to get tenure as a joint appointed faculty. Uh, I think, um, there, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, well, so I think if the question is, is there, um, have we collected national level data on that? I, I am not aware of a source that has summarized that, but that would be a fantastic thing for us to try to discover. Um, at Carnegie Mellon, I would say no. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make much difference at all in terms of uh, support for for tenure if you're joint versus if you're fully in one department. Um, you know, if, if anything, if you've got another, you know, if you've got multiple groups of people who are who are saying strong things about your work. That's that's just that's fantastic for you. I I do think that the, some of that perception of difficulty comes from the need to try to communicate with two different disciplines about the importance of your work. So when you're thinking about like, here's all the great statistical methodology work I did, do the neuroscientists, for example, also understand how strong this work is, you know, and then vice versa, right? Trying to explain to the more statistics and data science side, the interesting scientific problems that are being solved in neuroscience, right? The things that you're working on. So there is that angle to it, but I don't think that that necessarily translates into more difficult to get tenure. I think there's just more of a focus on trying to tell that story as you develop and making sure that you're working on communication, presentation. Um, I was even thinking when Jeff was answering the question about the CV, you know, we see more and more people referencing, um, 
in their cover letters and in their CVs, you know, websites where they're where they're showcasing the kinds of things that they do. People are posting, say, two to three minute videos where they're just talking about their work and giving an example. But, you know, these kinds of things that you can quickly click on and get conceptually the pro- something about the problem you're solving and then also why the technical work you did was so useful and high impact. Th- those, those kinds of things help a lot. And then, and then to whether then it's getting tenure, if everybody understands all of the work you're doing and at least the impact of the work you're doing, then I don't think it's much of an issue. At least we don't see that very much at Carnegie Mellon. Jeff, you have thoughts? I did have thoughts, but I think you said them all. I, I mean, as a pretty much right on right on tar- to target, I would say there's a little more hand wringing because people feel like they need to appeal yeah. to two different yeah. To, yeah to two different areas. But in, in in at least at UVA, both areas are working behind the scenes to make sure that person is successful because they'd like to see that joint connection made. And I think the key thing there is that the two units need to communicate. And so if you're a joint appointment, you can help the two units communicate by taking the feedback you got from one unit to the other unit and vice versa and talking about what those expectations are. So in most cases, they won't be perfectly aligned, but they can get aligned if you get them talking. So there's a little, I think there, that, I think that that would help, but otherwise I, I, I don't, what you said almost was what I was going to say exactly. So your neural networks match my <laughs> prediction. But you yeah, we're, we're doing it. We're doing it. Yes. Um, I do want to mention that, that some of the things we're saying right now makes it sound like the burden of the work is being put on the faculty member going through yeah. um, this to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of communication and understanding. And I just wanted to say to our, to our junior faculty, as well as people who are thinking about, who are looking to apply right now, you know, for, for those who, who may watch this later, when you are looking for um, places to work, you want to pay attention to how well do these different department heads or chairs or colleges communicate with each other. If, if you go, if you feel like you're a data science person and you go on interviews and you're, you know, engaging with things that looks like communication's a problem, you, you know, that, that's something to keep in mind. You, you want to make sure that you're in an environment where the, that kind of communication and, and telling that story is not entirely on you. You want to be a place where both sides, if you're, if you're going to be split, for example, or joint across two places, that they work well together. You can tell that they talk to each other. You know, they communicate with each other, that they are very much positively on board with having you in their units. Maybe, you know, keep an eye out for that because it's not all about you. You need a university infrastructure that, and people in your corner who will support you through this process. Oh, that's right. 100%. All right, I have uh, one last wrap up question because we're getting near the end here, but I wanted to pause for a second just to see if there's another quick question from the audience. Tor- Torbert asked um, a nice quick one, which is what is data science? And so <laughs> since we don't have another two hours, I, I, I'll just give you my quick uh, two second. I sent you what you, I had UVA think about this and write it down, but I think of it as studying data and the methods you learn from data, but not just any data, data as a generic concept. So how information is collected and communicated and how you do that in various situations. And so uh, it's a very broad for me definition. Um, and that, that's how I think about what data science is, which is close to statistics, but, but slightly different. And then you can be explicit about it, but even if you're not, oh, David, maybe doesn't want the association to focus on the definition, others feel the same way, but you can look at the administrative structure you can look at the curricula that they're offering and implicitly, you know, gather your definition of how that institution defines data science. Yeah. So, so many places, uh, many places, data science is machine learning, right? I, I don't think that that was the case with the examples here, but, but there are many places for which data science equals machine learning. And so if you're interested in machine learning and there's a group for that, then that's a really good fit. If you want to do data science and law or ethics, then that's not a good fit for you. Then that makes it harder. Looks like Jake, and you have a question. Yeah, I, I was going to ask that. I think you know, in my department, we're going through discussions about what is expected from tenure track data science faculty. Um, and I was curious if you had like guidance on what is becoming more standard practice in terms of teaching load um, and the exceptions to get you out of teaching you know, whether that's research or early career stage or, or other sort of things. 
Um, yeah. Well, it, oh yeah, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I'll just tell you, at UVA, we're a little bit different. So you heard Rebecca say a little bit about what um, what what their structure is. Where are one, two at the moment? Um, but we're we're pretty lax with that. So we'll decide. Can, we'll Jeff, decide. Jeffrey, sorry, can you? Because we hear a lot of two one one twos, and I don't know that anybody defined that right. for our early. So uh, folks, one course in uh, so three courses a year. One in one semester, two in another. So you can teach two in the fall, one in the spring, or the reverse. So if you're one one, you're teaching two courses. You're teaching year round, or two courses in one semester in some cases. Um, and so um, we, what we try to do is we try to be pretty flexible. Like if we need you to develop a course, we'll assign you a course development as a teaching module. So we use those to to sort of lighten up on the junior folks. And as well, when the junior folks come in, we don't start them with their load. There are a number of buyouts. So we so we so there's a slow burn over three years. Um, eventually, the school would like to be able to get that you know, to, to lower that, I think as many cases, but we're just too new to be able to, we, we've got to figure lots of things out before we get there. Yeah, and we're, at CMU, we're, yeah, at CMU, we're one and one. Um, every once in a while, somebody asks if they can front load their teaching, for example, and do two courses in the fall and zero in the spring, because, you know, they want, they have some research trip or something that they want to do, which, which we're flexible with. Um, and, and similarly to, to, to Jeff and UVA, we uh, do a slow burn. Um, we, we give people off uh, in the beginning when they're first starting. Um, they may only teach one course a year at the beginning. And um, we also give credit for things like, um, you know, yeah, building new things, right? And I, and I say new things versus classes because there's all, sometimes there's modules, software things. You know, it doesn't have to be that you're building a new course. The other thing we do is that, our teaching demands are heavy in the sense that um, so many people want to take our classes that we sometimes we can't give people off, but we'll give them, uh, we'll fund them over the summer. So, for example, if somebody needs to develop a new class or, or, or do some really, um, you know, some complex piece of curriculum work, we might not be able to get them off of teaching in the fall or the spring just because of what our capacity issues are, but we will fund them over the summer to do that work. So instead of them needing to look for grant funding, for example, the department just funds them. So that, that's another way that we manage that. Hmm. I unfortunately need to jump. So I'm going to pass the baton to Stella to ask the final question. Assuming everybody can stay on, I unfortunately have arrived at the airport that's ringing my doorbell. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you both so much for joining and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. This is great. So the last question is, um, what do you think the field of data science will look like in five to 10 years and how might this change um, data science scholarship respect to tenure, if at all? Um, so, so for me, like, maybe 10 years ago or so I'm trying to think when we first started writing white papers on academic data science so maybe that was like eight ish years ago when some of the like the park city white paper came out on data science and the asa report and things like that um you know there were an awful lot of master's programs being created we would hear all these stories of people who'd just essentially been told by their provost i need a master's program in data science you have six months go you know that kind of thing um, and, and literally, I, I think at one point when we were doing a National Academy study on the undergraduate perspective in data science, we did a landscape overview and there was something at the time like 400, 500 master's programs that claimed to be in data science and many of them were programs that already existed or, you know, courses that already existed, things that had been kind of pulled together. Um, you know, you didn't have the schools yet, you know, you had a lot of slapping things together on the education side. Um, and now what you see is a lot of very thoughtful, you know, returning to what it, what actually is data science and how do we want to train people for it. I think that initial wave of data science was pushed a lot by industry people asking us for data scientists and us trying to figure out how to quickly pull together degrees that got people the right skill sets to move into this role. But we really thought a lot about education and not a lot about research on the data science side. 
So I get asked that question quite a lot. What, what does it mean to do research in data science? And people talk about the kinds of data science-y kind of applied problems that they're trying to solve. But what I think you're going to see more of, and, and we do this at CMU, Hopkins was doing a bit of this for a while with um, Jeff Leak, who, who's now at the, um, at the Hutch, but um, we, 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 the science of data science. How do you actually optimize data science? How do you think about like pulling groups of people together to solve data science problems? How do you do research in the most robust ways to, to solve problems and come up with solutions that people, people can get behind? Um, you know, for example, one of the things we have going at Carnegie Mellon is a, is a cloud lab, which is democratizing, um, democratizing science. So people can send in code and instructions from all over the world into this academic cloud lab that will run series of experiments for them 24-7 and, you know, and help them if they don't have access to this incredibly expensive laboratory equipment. But how do we actually do that? How do we actually optimize those sequence of experiments? How do we get you know, theoretical guarantees on the performance of all of these black box algorithms? I think, I think the few, we were really quick to build programs and really quick to try to train people on how to do data science, but we really need to take a step back and think about like what's the best way to do data science, the research on the science of data science. I would love to see more of that, and I think if we don't push in that direction, this is just going—it's going to become a very applied field um, where we do a lot of data sciencey kind of things, but we don't really have a good understanding of the best way to do those data sciencey things. So that—that's kind of what I'm excited about for data science in the future. So I, I guess I would have something uh, similar, uh, perhaps not surprising, because um, I think Rebecca's right on point. I, I think um, for us, it, this has really come uh, to root home when you say you're going to build your own programs with your own courses. And it's a little bit easier to just say, I'm going to have a data science program and I'll take these stat courses you need to know. Then this computer science course and you need to have the, in this disciplinary area, you need these courses. We're trying the opposite, which is assume that there's some baseline knowledge. And then what are the core fundamentals of data science that you need that you should have, even if you don't end up working in that area? So for example, ethics is that. So we have students take a year of, of ethics and our ethics program is pretty broad, even if they're gonna do machine learning or high performance computing in areas that are related to data science. And it's hard because in many cases we end up teaching, I think, how to be uh, part of a scientific team, how to do science in some in some general sense, rather than you know how do you um, uh, you know just how do you fit a model uh, because because a lot of our students while they may learn in a particular lab or they may learn in a particular domain they often graduate and go on and do other things um, in different spaces so we want to teach them how they can take their tools and and apply them elsewhere but you have to know what those tools and what those fundamentals are right and so you might be do deep learning over here and you might be doing clinical trials over there you know who's to say they don't go together but you generally it's different skill set so um we're trying to figure out what that is and i would think over the next 10 years i'm hoping there'll be some more movement and i think that will uh, lead into what rebecca was saying is understand what does it mean to do research in data science Right. So now you're building students who can participate in labs who do data science. And for us, it's it's balancing the collaborative and methodological focus of a data scientist and trying to figure out what that is. And so I would hope in the next few years that that, that there'll be some coalescing of the discipline. And it'll be interesting because there are many disciplines that just want to be attached to data science. And so we'll just say, yep, we're data science, too, because we do a little bit of that. In the same way that a lot of disciplines uh, offer their own statistics courses. And so what I would hope is that we don't follow the statistics model where every course teaches their own stat course. There's stat psych, there's social psych, there's agricultural stats. You know, that's sort of a bill. I'd like to see the opposite method where there are some core data science courses that data science programs teach. And then if people are offering data science courses in uh, neuroimaging, for example, then there that's a high level course and not an introductory level course. So the intro level foundations should be taught by data science and the applications of which that are unique for your particular area should be taught in, in your department. So it's the complete flip of the model that we have now. So I'd like to see that get developed over the next 10 years or so, whether it will or not. I, I think know. that would be great. Yeah. 
So just to kind of bring it back to career tips. So if I were, you know, applying for a tenure track faculty job, or I'm going to be say in like five years, maybe I just started a PhD program. Um, do you have any recommendations for someone like me and where maybe I should specialize in building skills and sort of helping you, you know, move towards that future so we can all kind of collectively see this happen? I think there's a there's a choice that you have to make, which is whether or not you want to be more of a collaborative data scientist or whether you want to be um, sort of a very focused sort of research engineer type, because the mo the modes of um, the modes of education I'm finding are very different. So you either go into a lab and there's only one or two labs in the world that are working on a particular area. And you won't do a lot of coursework, but you'll learn exactly that. And when you come out, that's your marketable skill. That's a different educational model than, say, a more traditional statistical or IT model, which is just sort of there are lots of things that you need to know. You'll go deep in an area, but you've got a broad base and you sort of sacrifice either time or a little um, or a little uh, narrowness to be broad. Um, and so you'll have to make a decision about what you want to sort of do later on and then pick something that you really like, because if you don't like it, you never finish. And then that comes through. People get excited when you're excited about your work. Um, and that's, I think, if you're excited about your work and you really want to make contributions, then a lot of other things fall in place. Yeah. How about you, Rebecca? Do you have any sort of final tips there for where yeah, someone sure. should specialize? Well, I think um, I think I would be wary of specializing too much in a. I, I really liked what Jeff said about that kind of the different modes of education for those different roles. So, so let's say you're going to be a collaborative data scientist. Let, let's let's go to that first one. Um, I think I would be a little bit cautious unless you really know that you want to work in, and I keep using neuroscience as an example, but fill in anything you want there. Unless you really know that you want to be working collaboratively in neuroscience um, for your career, uh, I, would, I would try to find some, you know, start your PhD with maybe some shorter, smaller projects in different fields um, to, to show that you can, you can learn how to work with different scientists in different fields, you know, that you can collaborate, that you may not be an expert in those different fields, but that you, you, you can work with them, right? Because those kinds of skills are really transferable. The, the ability to take a scientific problem, talk to the scientists, learn from them, translate that into kind of a statistical approach or a data science computing, et cetera, do that technical work, and then translate it back into the scientific problem, you know, to talk about why the solution is important, how it's solving the scientific problem. That, that's an amazing skill that, that you could use over and over and over again. And so I might don't do that for you. Don't don't hop around for your dissertation. Of course, you need to focus, but you might early in your PhD try to have a few of those small experiences where you're kind of doing a little bit of collaborative research in a couple of different spaces to start to start building those skills up. Great, thank you. And just to tack on for those who are late stage, <laughs> and it's uh, maybe they're feeling like, oh no, it's too late. Um, do you recommend that they do it's like not a postdoc? Too late. It's or... Never too late. <laughs> Um, okay. I'm not a big uh, fan of a postdoc, actually. I don't know what Rebecca. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I, I, you know what, learning, learning is a lifelong process. You know, I see a lot of hesitation in our in our graduate students who've now got this idea that they need to get a postdoc before they can go do anything. And I, I'm kind of with Jeff. I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to go do a postdoc. I think you want to go find really smart people to work on really cool problems. And you, you, can, you will gain all sorts of skills for the rest of your career. You're, you're gonna learn new techniques and new approaches and new fields 20 years from now, you know? Like it's, it's um, you don't need to be kind of fully baked before you go out there on the market, so to speak. That's right. Um, it, it's, it's, you always, there's always evolution that happens, always learning, always learning. The only case where I think a postdoc is helpful is if you want if you're switching an area of expertise. So if you're if you're studied, you know, uh, human computer interaction, you want to learn genetics, and you take a year or two to learn it as a postdoc. Okay, but but for most people, I've found, and I, I get I ask get asked about this all the time. People will apply for a job, and then we'll offer, it, and then they'll say, "But can I do a postdoc for a year?" And I usually tell them, "No, you should get paid the full amount." 
for your expertise. We'll give you time to organize whatever you need to organize, get your research out there. That's part of the process, but there's no reason to wait and delay that in 99% of the cases. It's not, we're not a field like physics or some biology fields where there's just no jobs. And so those postdocs are holding patterns to make yourself look better over the time and increase your accomplishments. We're not there yet. We need a lot of good people out. And I would encourage people to just go make the jump. Agreed. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for staying a little bit late. Thank you audience for staying late as well. Um, I will be distributing this video online. And so I'll let everybody know when it's ready. Thank you all again for your time. Bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.